Carl and Brendan here from Games Brains and Headbanging Life. You've seen the title. It is sometimes dead is better. This is our Stephen King book to movie, TV show, adaption talk throughs. And we are looking at one of the classics, one of the most well known. It is the 1976 supernatural horror film, Carrie. Yes, we go into the original here, directed by Brian De Palma. From a screenplay written by Lawrence D. Cohen, and of course, adapted from King's 1974 novel of the same name. You know the fucking movie. If you're a horror movie fan, you'll have seen this, regardless of if you're a King fan. It is infinitely famous, infinitely beloved. So much so that uh, I thought this was amazing. This is one of the rare films, particularly in horror, that was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. In 2022, this was decision was made. Wow. That's yeah. a pretty cool thing to have on your Twitter bio or whatever. <laughs> yeah, because I don't know many, but the only one I know off the top of my head that 100% is in it is Night of the Living Dead, Romero's right. Night of the Living Dead. And so, like, Carrie's sharing the same space as that. That's like pretty cool. Absolutely. It was released theatrically on November 3rd, 1976. And uh, I didn't I didn't expect this, so it was quite a surprise. It was actually successful, grossing over 33 million against its 1.8 million budget, which is incredible money. Mm. It is. Do you know, like it, it it always blows my mind, right? We know that Kings are heavily adapted author, right? You know, there's no denying that. Mm. I don't know outside of horror, but like to me, he's the most heavily adapted author I know of. He's got to be. He's got right. to be number one, right? He's got to yeah. be. Um, I always found it amazing that that journey for him started so early, right? Because Carrie was his debut novel. It was the first mm. book he ever had published. I'm sure he wrote stuff before, but the first book he ever had published. 1974, that's released. Within two years, the first adaptation that seems really quick for a brand new author right yeah and i know it was successful and it was deemed good and the book was well reviewed and went critically and and whatnot as well but it still seems early like normally you think maybe like 10 12 books in there people are starting to maybe think about adapting a book or, or not but to go it's like they were waiting for him <laughs> you know it's mad isn't it two years 1974 you released your debut 1976 there's a a successful movie done. No wonder he got his head blown up and started doing thinking I can direct movies and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, go check out the last uh, Sometimes Dead is Better to get our thoughts on that. I did actually find some interviews. There's obviously lots of interviews over the years with King about Carrie. I didn't want to list all his quotes, but I just thought this one was particularly fascinating. And it's he was paid just two thousand five hundred thousand, uh, sorry, two thousand five hundred dollars for the film rights for this, but. He has said, look, I, I was fortunate to have this happen to my very first book. So he's acknowledged that completely. Yeah. While it was fuck all money, even back then, it was his first book. He's as happy that happened. Yeah. I mean, it certainly didn't do him any harm, did it? He did mm -hmm. all right. And look, it's common knowledge, folks, that this is widely considered to be uh, the best, one of the best adaptions of Stephen King's work uh, to date. Um, it's simple as that. This isn't just critics. This is critics and audiences alike. Both sides are like, yeah, this literally is the jam. I think everybody knows that. It's a movie I've seen tons of times. Mm -hmm. And it's a movie you've seen tons of times. It's a book I know well. And there are changes. There are changes. But this is where I'm going to say it. I think a lot of the changes or things that are left out from the book are probably the right thing to do in most circumstances. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, I don't know. There's, there's one aspect to it that I prefer in the book. But, but you know. Uh, but I think I've also seen in an interview with King where he himself, especially in regards to the ending, suggests that the film was better and that he wished he'd come up with it. So, Well, I do think the ending is better than the book. Uh, I will say the ending of this movie has something that I don't particularly like, but I, we'll get to that, I think, as well. Uh, so cast, I mean, a lot of uh, important people now more than anything else. Of course, Sissy Spacek played Carrie White. Uh, this, I mean, what a fucking, wow. Wow. Wow, it's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But on par is Piper Laurie as Margaret White, one of the most hateable, hateable uh, characters in any of King's work. It's bad that like 50 years later, you know, even if I didn't have to rewatch this film, I still feel like a certain amount of disdain towards Carrie's mother. Like, do you know what I mean? I still think, oh, fucking religious nut 
bitch. Yeah, yeah. And uh, whenever I saw Piper Laurie and anything else, it was like, oh, it's you. <laughs> so angry at you. Yes. Uh, Amy Irving is Sue Snell. William Cat. Love yep. William Cat. If you are a fan of the lovely, wonderful 80s movie House, you'll know who William Cat is. Yep. Uh, he played Tommy Ross. John Travolta. Freaking up. Everyone kind of forgets that. I, I did, actually. I rewatched this just to have, but just because I wanted to, and I, start, I thoroughly enjoyed the rewatch. Um, and when he popped up, I was like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Never, and he plays Billy just... Nolan. Yes. Well, he well he does. Sorry, now. sorry he, yeah. he was. I mean, he was never young. Mm. Is, what, is what I kind of mean because I look at him in that and I think like, you don't look like a kid. Nancy Allen as Chris Harginson, Betty Buckley as Miss Collins, and last but not least, although there are more names, is the one I wanted. Play, as PJ Souls, wonderful PJ Souls as Norma watson uh it's a great cast overall of characters all doing their roles really well i've got no complaints about the cast really there are a couple of dodgy lines a little bit of odd dialogue and, and clearly older actors playing teenagers but hey they ain't the first and not the last to do that yeah now before we talk about this movie uh go through some of the scenes and sequences i feel we have to talk about the sequels because we've covered a fair amount of them or a things that have gone on outside of the world of Carrie, because it's not just one movie. It is actually a franchise to a degree. Uh, so I wanted to touch upon them, particularly because you wrote a review for one, I wrote a review for another, and the other one hasn't been touched yet. So let's start first with the one I did, which is the actual Carrie sequel. Yes, people, there is a Carrie sequel. It is called The Rage Carrie 2, and was released in 1999, and it features another teenager with powers, who's revealed to have shared a father with Carrie White, so I guess the dad was the one. It is fucking terrible! Go check out the review of that. If you ever got like an hour and a half spare and you just some, want some 90s trash, that <laughs> this is it. This is it perfectly. You might even be entertained because it is so, now, by today's standards, it's so dated. It's got that 90s feel. Uh, but yeah, that actually exists. Then there was a 2002 television film. Now, this is the one we haven't covered. Uh, starring Angela Bettis in the titular role. Now, I don't know a lot about this, and it was a television movie, but what I did notice was, though most people said, hey, it's not as good as the original, this actually gets a lot of praise, including yeah. Bettis's portrayal of Carrie. So reading this, I was like, shit, I might have to check this out soon and just for the review more than anything else. Have you seen this? No, I haven't seen it. I mean, I know it exists only because when I was looking on multiple streaming services to rewatch Carrie the other night, it kept popping up with the 2002 one. I kept trying to find the 1976 one. I was like, no, that ain't it. Who the fuck's that? That ain't it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like, oh, yeah, but up until that point, I didn't actually know the 2000. I don't re think I knew the 2002 one existed. I know the sequel well enough. I have seen the sequel. Ooh. I've seen it for a long time, but I do know I've seen the sequel. Um, I also don't like it. But I do under I, I guess the only thing I remember about the sequel, not in terms of what's happens in it, but I, I remember... I don't know where I read this or even if now I'm just imagining a, a memory. Like, do you know what I mean? But it's the actual ending of Carrie in the book that drove the sequel to mm. become in existence. Mm. Because the very ending of the book, the original book, um, it ends with King uh, some, with a letter being sent and then receiving a letter about another person saying, oh, mm. my, my child appears to have similar things to what happened in your town. And that that was the driving thing. So technically, although I don't know if King ha King King is involved in the sequel or not, but he definitely no. it's, his, it's his fault. <laughs> I should. You've just nailed something. So go on, but sticking what you've just described there, and that actually is major part of the two thousand and two television film. In fact, it it stays true to the novel, and apparently. This the the letter sending is the drive because Carrie doesn't spoilers die in the 2002 television film. Oh, in fact, right. she goes off to plan apparently help people who need you know with yeah. other telekinetic powers. And apparently, this was going to be for a never realized TV show series, Carrie uh, TV series. Well, I'm glad they didn't go too far with this stuff because, like, I know they class it as a franchise, but for most Stephen King fans or most fans of horror. When I you say carry to me, this is the carry I think about and the carry I remember, and I don't need there to be four thousand fucking versions of it to ruin and dilute what is for me a you know a, a fantastic movie. 
Well, we don't have to talk about 10 years old as of uh, this year. It is, of course, the Carrie remake. You reviewed this, uh, mm. well, ages ago, actually. This is an old yeah. one review for you. Uh, yeah. Carrie remake. I've never seen this because I never really wanted to. Uh, obviously, Chloe uh, Chloe Grace Mortet plays, yeah. um, plays uh, yeah, that's Carrie. right, uh, plays Carrie. Julia Moore plays Margaret White. There's a few other characters here yeah, and it's there. It's got a decent well. sized cast, really, mm. you know, in terms of name, even for that period. Um, they're all famous enough. Like, do you know what I mean, it weren't like they were unknowns doing this and then going on to be famous. The Chloe Grace Moretz was very well known by this point. Um, so I don't think it was a cheap remake. Mm. It's. Do you remember much of it? Yeah, I remember loads about it. I just the thing with it, right, is that it's not the world's worst film, right? It's another one of these remakes that you've questioned the point of it, mm. uh, and and the main. Ch- difference in it this time around is they actually because it, i guess they had to but they sort of set it in modern times yep so they don't remake it as in this is a film from you know we're setting it back in the 70s and 80s now the problem i found with that is that actually a lot of the charm of carrie comes from the time period i think mm. and a lot of the things that happen in that don't translate well to modern times right so you know we're talking modern schools modern you know all that sort of stuff and it just doesn't translate as well that's all no real problems with acting performances or anything like that. It's just a completely pointless, you know, let's set Carrie in the modern time. I was going to wait 20 years and we'll set her again in the modern time. Yeah. You don't really get the same buy-in with the religious nut side of things. Like, you know, you. I'm not saying that doesn't happen today, but I'm just, you feel like it's more believable 40, 50 years ago. You could see you would have been more isolated. Mm, exactly. Yeah. There's no social media, but in this, they got mobile phones. They got, yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? It was, yeah, it was just it was just less believable. Like it, it would have almost been a better version if they just actually tried to redo it with, like, set it back in time a little bit. So yeah, we will we will we will inevitably have to cover at some point that not only the two thousand and thirteen remake because it is that's an adaption and the two thousand and two one as well at some point in the future. I mean, we've we've done both Pet Cemetery, so Carrie will eventually get there as. Well, um, we are going to kind of talk you through some of the major sort of story points about this. And we'll stop and discuss things that kind of stand up for us. Yeah. I mean, what's everyone's first thought about Carrie, really, when you think about the beginning? Obviously, it's the introduction of Carrie. You know, she's a very shy, very reserved, very in her own world, 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 not just because she's heavily bullied at school. I mean, it's incredible, really heartbreaking stuff. But of course, she lives with her mother, Margaret who is fanatically religious. It is classic King. Yes. And not a great shine, uh, not shining a great light on religion, but that is King through and through. Absolutely. He likes to challenge societal norms. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed. Of course, obviously the famous introduction is, is Carrie experiencing her first period in a school shower. Uh, Having never had one before, she panics, freaks out. It's a very, very, very hard to watch scene. Even now, even after seeing it so many times, you know, particularly as the classmates throw tampons in at her, chanting, plug it up and all that kind of stuff. It's just really harrowing stuff, man. Uh, It's iconic, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It really, really, it it sets the scene for the movie, like, because, you know, imagine going into this, like, not read the book, never seen this before. You don't know what's going on. The first section of this film really kind of goes to town in almost being like a shower scene for Mm. for these school kids. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of hair on show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, it's the, the era. <laughs> um, so, you know, you kind of, I guess I was like, I was trying, I was looking at it. I was thinking like, God, so at this point you don't really know what, what's going on. So for it to switch from that kind of scene to, you know, suddenly carry and everyone throwing things out and all that, it's really quite traumatic, man. Like to watch it's, it's really harrowing. And I think it's really brilliant in that it instantly, Instantly makes you sympathize like you you instantly feel for carrie you know there's no you don't ever like you never come out of it thinking like oh god how stupid is she or anything like, like you're instantly like oh you know fuck these pupils that's yeah. horrible a hundred percent as well and of course we're two dudes we cannot relate so for goodness sake if we're taking that from it jesus christ and it doesn't help you know when she does go home her mother Basically, this is where we sort of see the level of religious fanaticism around it, causing claiming that her menstruation is caused by sin, which, you know, Jesus Christ woman, seriously. And then we kind of get the first view of the prayer closet. It's like, yeah, cl- it's a closet with an altar that she forces and keeps Carrie in to pray until she's decided she's 
I don't know, forgiven. Fucked up statue of Jesus I've ever seen in my life. It looks <laughs> like Howard Stern. <laughs> I was just like, what the, why are they but worshipping Howard Stern? What's all this about? <laughs> oh, they like a, good... They've done it on purpose, obviously, because they can zoom on it in on its face quite a bit. And it has like, um, like um it feels like it's got glowy eyes uh, a little bit, mm. you know. But I also thought even that was clever because it was adding an element of fear around the religion, you know. I don't think this is one of King's most subtle uh, jabs at religion no, at no. all. No, he went straight for it, man. And that's <sighs> brave. Not That's brave for a debut book in a country that, same as where we live, which would around that era have deemed itself a Christian country. And, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree. Um, it's the debut side more than anything else. This is well before we have the King tropes. We yeah. don't know what the tro- now, tropes are. Now he, he can do what he likes, really. But back then, like that can make or break you, man, like releasing a book like that. If the if the Christian element of the country decided to turn on you, like, mm. you're done, aren't you? So obviously her tormentors, they get in trouble at school because, um, you know, Carrie does have backup in the teachers. They struggle, but they try to help her. Miss Collins in particular tries to help her and punishing them for like, uh, it's like a week long detention or something like that. Yeah, but there's a kind of like for a boot camp sort of thing, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like gym. Yeah, like it's a gym yeah. kind of thing. Um, but obviously, some of them, particularly Chris, Chris is the really the main, yeah. the main bully, if you want, the uh, really unlikable, well acted, and incredibly, you and know, it's it, very manipulative. And mm. you know, it's, um, one of the things I must say, I must say, the teacher, and I know it's of an era now, but you did make me laugh so many times watching it. Is like the amount of times that teacher walks around slapping people around the chops is unreal. <laughs> just like bang, bang, like just literally happy slapping everybody. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's all based around the fact that it's like, look, if you try to skip out of this detention, if you just don't show up, you will be banned from Mm -hmm. barred from coming to the prom. And that's a big deal for these young women and young men. Um, You know, uh, you know, we know it is, even though it's not our jam, it's not our thing. We know it is for them. But that is eventually what Chris does after kind of getting it with the teacher. She walks out and is excluded from the prom, which decides, hey, that's Carrie's fault, right? It's all her fault. Uh, you know, which is what a bully fucking does. Yeah, that's kind of what's happening as well, because it's like you said, the PE teacher, the gym teacher is doing, she's trying to protect Carrie a bit, you know, mm-hmm. she she seems very nice. Uh, but by punishing the other girls, she makes it worse, actually, yeah. because, you know, I don't know, like, yeah, it, it, it's weird. I don't, you kind of look at it and you think, like, if she hadn't, say, done that harsh punishment and detention, if all those threats hadn't happened, would the prom scene even have happened? <laughs> you know of course of course yeah it is it really is the case so we all know what the setup and the plan is um chris her boyfriend billy they're basically gonna get their revenge and humiliate carrie once and for all the breaking into a farm draining the blood getting the pig's blood and setting it above the school station gymnasium uh as well as rigging the election um so yeah. carrie will will win win prom queen that's the plan um but alongside, we also introduced to Sue Snell here, particularly. She's She's been involved. She's one of those hangers-on. She's been involved, and it's not that she's squeaky clean here or anything like that, but she does feel bad, seems to have gone feeling that it's gone too far and is remorseful about it, which makes her a more likable character. She basically tries to atone for yeah. some of the mistakes she's made. She is a likable character. She is, yeah. Uh, because of the way it all starts with her, it, it, you do have a sort of like they do actually in the film as well, but I think you feel it too, is that sort of sense of trepidation of, is she messing with, mm. with Carrie? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, you, you're not entirely sure, but as it kind of continues to involve you, you know, you realise that, yeah, she she has remorse. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, because early on you kind of think she gets her boyfriend, her well-liked boyfriend, Tommy Ross, basically, can you take Carrie to the prom? Yeah. Um, you know, he does agree to do it, even though when, when he does proposition Carrie, she also is like, thinks it's a fucking yeah. prank. And the, the teacher as well pulls him to one side and is like, right, what what the hell are you two up to? You know? Yeah. Yeah, which you completely understand. Why yeah. wouldn't you think this? Yeah. You know, thankfully, the what's quite good that works in the favor is the actors that play Sue and Toby combined have nice faces, they're soft faces, and how they choose to express this compared to, say, Chris. Chris is a sneer constantly throughout this fucking movie. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> She's fucking mental, like, in this film. Mm. Her relationship with... Um, Billy, is it John Travolta's character? Yeah. Aside from constantly hitting each other, like the scene in the car, 
where he's like, she's calling him a dumb shit. He's punching her in the face. She's then pretending to like try and kiss him and stuff and then pull him back. It's so weird and toxic and manipulative. It's unreal. Mm. But there is this underlying feeling of tension. You know where it's going because what the film does, it lets you in on the plan early. It's not like yeah. it keeps it hidden from us. You know what the plan is. You can see the setup and you're just kind of waiting for it either to come to fruition or fail, whatever it might be. Of course, during this, Carrie starts to notice she has telekinesis powers because it is a supernatural thing. Um, as she sort of starts to get ready for the prom, this is where, again, she kind of gets into her mother. My God, Piper Laurie is brilliant. She's mental. Yes, Denounce and Carrie's a witch when she sees some of these powers, but Carrie does leave with Tommy. We get to the prom. Carrie looks lovely in her dress and all of those elements. But during this, we also focusing on Chris and Billy and their plan switching the ballots and showing that Carrie wins, getting her on stage. And of course, and just sort of enjoying the moment, getting a round of applause, standing next to Tommy, who up to this point has been nothing but a charming individual. You know, he's taken it to the prom. He clearly, you kind of get his mind. He's like, yeah, look, I might be doing this for my girlfriend, but I'm going to try and make sure Carrie has the nicest time possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Enjoy the sweetness because it's about to end. Uh, Mrs. Collins does actually spot Sue. And obviously suspects that because Sue shouldn't have been there. She was banned as well from the prom. And because Tommy's there and she's come along, she thinks she's going to be up to times good and basically stops her, throws her out of the prom, which means Sue's not around to help when things go wrong. Of course, we all know what happens next. We all know what happens next. Bucket of pig's blood, dropped over Carrie, soaking her in it completely uh, in front of every single person there. Stunned silence, including, we should say, the bucket dropping and smashing Tommy in the head. Poor fella. Yeah. Takes him out. Did you? I, I don't. I, I, I've always wondered. Did do you reckon it killed him there, or it just knocked him out? They never tell us. Mm. Um. And the book, I guess in the book they're pretty. He's probably dead. I can't remember if he's actually named as dead in the book, but the book's different in it because it's not just set in the school. Um. So he probably took took him out there, but yeah, I can't remember that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Either way, he isn't surviving, folks. It's as simple as that. Very few people are. Of course, you know this scene. You know this sequence. It's so fucking famous from the way it was shot, the way it is filmed, to the insane level of violence that goes on. Because humiliated, and it's done in very slow motion, and the lighting and all of that, and it's an incredible role from Sissy Space like here. But she does sort of, looking out upon the crowd, who are all sort of standing in stunned silence. There's not, you know, mean like that, but she basically hallucinates. And you know it's a hallucination based off yeah. one particular thing, everyone mocking her and laughing and, you know, humiliating her. But uh, you know it's a hallucination because Miss Collins, yeah. who has never been this character, is laughing and mocking her too. That was the biggest clue, in it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Anyway, of course, you've seen the bug-eyed, you've seen the shots, you've seen the lighting. This is Carrie's utilising her telenetic powers to basically fuck up everyone in this gym, in this party. Uh, we should note that Chris and Billy actually managed to sneak out of the school before this occurs. They actually watch the chaos from a window. Obviously, Sue's out of the place as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, the way this is shot, there's so many elements at this that are insane. The fire hose, the overhead lights, uh, Miss Collins, how she dies. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, I love yeah. the colour change. I love, the, obviously, the, the visual, man, because that wide-eyed, so slow and motionless, almost, almost like a fucking demon or a ghost just like floating like along you know what i mean mm -hmm. um but it's yeah. also like it goes to complete silence and i love that about it there's not like huge effects and music suddenly comes in and everything like that a lot of the people kind of getting fucked up stuff is done in complete silence which just adds more to it and it's almost like you're in carrie's kind of mindset she can't hear anything she can't really see anything and uh other than like you said what she's hallucinating um it's, it's a reaction it's an emotional reaction rather than a vicious one you know and while it is an extreme, obviously, example of it, we are looking at someone that has been mercilessly tortured and tormented yep. for such a period of time, breaking. Yeah. The shot of her walking out, as you say, hovering, as it were, you used that term, it really makes sense, floating, gliding along while the place burns down around her, slamming the door shut, trapping everyone in there, the survivors, to basically burn to death. It is as harsh as it sounds. This was a very, I would say, while King's Book itself is brave for its time, 
this was very brave even for 76 i know we had plenty of horror and stuff like that but this was yep. mainstream in 76 and that's wow yeah no yeah and it done well that's the mad thing about it that's the thing so obviously there was something in the water that people were ready for it Mm, yeah yeah you're not wrong we are uh we're about what seven or eight years away from the video nasty scare in the uk too so um this one's never part but thankfully but as carrie walks home in a trance almost uh chris and billy haven't seen what she did attempt the runner over with billy's car but carrie uses her powers to flip it overturn it explode do love that stunt do do love a car flipping over practical effect it's a good one here again yeah i also quite like the way that they're sort of dealing with this stuff because chris is obviously the main kind of, well she's not really the mum's the main bad guy that's the thing mm. right? but chris chris is a secondary kind of other stream of bad guy in this and billy's a bit more of a lap dog but like with that's no it, conscience or anything like that you know and i think like if they did a scene like this now it would make a big point of chrissy looking out of the car and maybe having remorse or carrie being angry and all that and that, like they don't do any of that it's just it's cold and robotic almost isn't it the car's over burned move on yeah and, and i love the way they deal with that i think it's really really good yeah well put well put obviously then of course we kind of need to deal with the mum situation carrie goes home she kind of just calmly bathes herself but margaret then does reveal some truths that uh carrie was conceived when her husband was drunk because you do wonder you're like okay so she was married at some stage yeah she's so heavy religious i mean not like heavily religious people haven't slept together or one of sex and um, for procreation reasons or anything like that. Yeah. But, you know, Carrie's mother is quite insane. So even before you kind of know, I did wonder, okay, what's the scenario here? Is it, is she a product of rape? Is it that kind of thing? And so on. But it's, her husband was drunk, but Margaret admits that she enjoyed it. And that's obviously kind of something that's really bothered her. And I guess that feeling going against all our religious dogma creates this hatred of Carrie. Yeah. That that scene when Carrie's walking towards the bathroom upstairs and the mum's kind mm. of faded uh, against the wall behind the door, I honestly find that fucking creepy as hell. I really do. Nothing even happens. She just walks upstairs towards the bathroom and then it slowly. It doesn't even it doesn't zoom in or anything. It doesn't do anything stupid. It just as she gets nearer the bathroom, it becomes clear that the mother is just standing there with a maniacal fucking look on her face. Yeah, creepy fucking woman. <laughs> uh, she does actually comfort Carrie briefly but she actually uses it as an opportunity to stab her in the back and the kind of go she's trying to kill Carrie seeing her as a demonic figure so to speak but Carrie uses her powers to basically stab her to death crucifying her in a position like that again uh, I consider that incredibly brave for the time <laughs> yeah again yeah like you said with the king's message in this book and film it's pretty clear <laughs> it is and then i guess in her grief uh mm. for what she's done because she, it's one of those things you can tell she loves her mother do you know what i mean she just needed a supportive figure do you know what i mean and, you know and stuff like that she might have been able to deal with bullies if she'd come home to a supportive figure and stuff like that and in her grief she basically brings the her entire house down upon her and uh presumably dies in this i love yeah. this scene i think it, i think this is the most emotionally charged scene mainly because of the music yeah and it's like there's a few points in the film where they use music well actually mm. um this this is definitely one of them but i also think it really kind of gives because i think what's happening by now um after what happens with her mother is carrie she's kind of breaking right like i don't think at first she's meaning to bring the house down i think it's just mm. like she has no control she has fear power. almost yeah yeah and she tries to get her mother like she tries to unhook her mother and tries to drag her like she's going towards the door but then almost just gives up right it's like it's really quite sad and you know and then sort of like holds her mother doesn't she as it all just kind of comes crashing down on her it's a very yeah. sad scene it is considering is. we're watching a person and sympathizing with a person who's just like literally destroyed like what well, i don't know 50 70 100 y children essentially <laughs> yeah it is a weird woman they do that i mean it's not the first it won't be the last that's managed to turn what is a vill mm. very villainous act into something that you can go yeah yeah kind of like <laughs> anti-hero in it but you know we understand like in a way you kind of want the mum to be took out of course you do and and chris mm. and billy and uh, the other bullies because that's really 
the purpose right but you kind of think like there's still like another 50 odd people in there teachers included who did nothing wrong yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And for me, that's where the film ends, as it should have. Yeah. Uh, I think Fading the Black there, leaving you behind with that powerful moment would have been more than enough. But that, unfortunately, is not where it ends. Now, I'm not, like, so anti this extra bit, like, where it ruins the movie for me or anything like that. It To me, it just feels pointless. Um, before I say it, do you do you care for it? Do you feel the same, or are you okay with this? I tell you, I'd, I I would have been happy with one more part of the scene after this, right? Which is that I think I would have liked to have known what happened to Sue. Okay. So I I kind of would have, you know, so you kind of see her. Uh, I know it's done in a dream scene, but whether it just showed her laying in the bed, and the you know, or whether it showed her like putting flowers down somewhere or something like that, it would have been because I, I you don't actually know like she got thrown out of the building, but you don't know if she survived or anything mm. like that. So I I felt like that was worth closing that off. But I don't think I needed the jump scare sort of element at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's literally what happens as we see. And immediately it's made clear this. If you remember uh, for a certain period in horror, particularly and more movies of an era to amplify the idea of it was a dream, they would film it in a way it'd be hazy. Yeah. It'd normally be quite bright. It Foggy around me. the sides and it. Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me a lot of what Nightmare on Elm Street did quite early on. Oh, in and the, the dream 80s. sequences and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, because Sue, uh, being the only survivor of the prom, basically lays flowers on the charred remains of Carrie's home. There's a for sale sign up for some reason, but yeah. it's been vandalized. Yeah, vandalized with the words Carrie Whiteburn in Burns in Hell, which would obviously be the town's reaction to it being hated for it. And as Brendan said, there's a jump scare as Carrie's arm reaches out and grabs Sue's forearm. That's yeah. my biggest issue. It's a jump scare, it's unnecessary. Yeah, and I feel. Um... You know, that effect they used to well they probably still use but used a lot in older horror movies that kind of high pitch yeah yeah, yeah. The violin, like the sort of fucking, yeah absolutely and then we see sue waking up and screaming in terror in a bed as her mother tries to comfort I, I i will say we didn't talk much about sue throughout it beyond the starting point but she does play a pivotal role in this uh, more than we probably talked about the focus is on carrie it's on her mother it's mm-hmm. on Chris more than any other part. So, do you know I mean, Sue, Sue is a good backing character. And so someone you needed to like. Because, yeah, like yeah. you said, there will be many people that are like, I don't know why people feel, you know, oh, we feel sorry for Carrie, but she's still a mass murderer. You're absolutely right. So you need someone to hold on to. And it's like, okay. Yeah, you do. Let's grab I mean, on the, Sue. Yeah. Having those nice characters around, like Tommy, Sue, mm-hmm. Uh, who become nice because at first you don't know that and also you don't even know that with Tommy right because while he appears nice you also know he's popular and a lot of the films that are based around the popular kind of sporty kind of guy that guy tends to not be the greatest person yeah you know and I I guess that just adds to the emotional depth of the film right because if it it wouldn't have had the same impact if it was just like six of the really bad guys that we all hated that she took out in the gym and then kind of moved on of course. You know I mean, it had to be everyone. It had to show the fact that it was like an almost utter breakdown, no mm. control over her powers, everything coming back at her at once and just not able to deal with it. And for that, you need nice people that you like as well to be taken out, you know? Yeah. But I did like Sue as a character. I thought she was a very useful tool in the film to move things on. Like she's very, very important. It's her remorse that really triggers everything, really. Mm. Um, and then and that's why I wanted to know what had happened to her at the end like you know that was it i just wanted something that showed me she was alive she was dead i don't know it could have been a gravestone with a name on it it could have been i don't you know I mean just something something no i understand that i think it's a fair point you said at the start there's something from the book that you would have liked to have been in a movie do you remember what it was well it was more more a running theme actually throughout mm-hmm. it but i do understand it and i understand that this was a debut and all that sort of stuff for me the biggest difference between the book and the film is how dark the book is. The book is much darker than the film, even though the film is very dark. Hmm. So King being King, the scenes that he describes between her mother and Carrie are way more vicious in the book, like way more. He goes into it's written word, right? Detail was heavy. Hmm. More and more events are described. You know, it's, it's, um, in, intense um carrie's powers are more amplified in the book right yeah i remember that yeah yeah so that's why it's like the whole fucking town is taken out mm. not just uh you know a school and a gym now i understand why they didn't go that way and actually probably would have ruined it 
but I guess because I remember the book so well and know the book well, as bad as Carrie's mum is in the film, like she's a pussycat compared to what she is in the book. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like, it's not like a, it's not a major problem in that. And I actually think if they had done the book as dark as they had, it possibly wouldn't have achieved success mm. because this is pretty dark, right? You know, and I, I don't know where the line was. Um, you know, it starts getting a lot further than that, and it's like Carrie being cut with knives and stuff like that. Maybe it goes too far. Starts entering um, X-rated territory with yeah, the rating system. Probably would be in your video nasties collection potentially. Mm. You know. There were things, though, that I prefer in the film to the book. I actually think it makes a lot more sense the way that Carrie looks, because in the book she's described as overweight, uh, with acne and all that sort of stuff. Of course! You know, so there's the, the, the difference in the character, but I always felt that it was a bit weird, because you're also given the impression that gluttony would be a huge sin, right? So the fact that Carrie would be massively overweight and, you know, would yeah. maybe not, not quite cut it. But then that's also another factor that worked in the book because it was another thing that the mum used against her. You know, mm. it's another sin that Carrie was always committing. So I don't know. There are some differences that I was all right with. Um, I, I know King said he preferred the film ending. Yeah. I don't know. if I, I don't really care either way. I think both endings are okay. I think yeah. in both of them I would have probably you know may, maybe stop because in the book it goes to town after it there's a bit there's a lot more right there's a national emergency declared because the whole town's been taken out then we have the letter stuff like do you know what i mean so again in the book like you feel like the carry story is done at the point the destruction stops mm. right? so in the film that's the house collapses in you feel like the story's told now so anything after that is kind of unnecessary overkill and in the book, it's the same. Like, well, the town is done. Everything's destroyed. Everything after that is just, like, you know, extra. It's just fat, isn't it? So, yeah, it, look, look, there's no negatives, though. Like, I don't want to diss it either way. I'm I'm okay with the ending of the book. I'm okay with the ending of the film. Like, it doesn't hurt me in any way. What we, we, we put this in the top tier of our tier list that we did uh, probably a good two years ago. We were ranking adaptions at the time that we were familiar with, and it was in the top tier one. Do you, ignoring that, but the uh, a question surrounding it, where does this one rank in regards to the amount of times you've seen this one? Oh, man. It's going to be high, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely in double figures with it, mm. I think. Yeah, no, I definitely am. Would you reckon more than... Because I reckon I've seen Carrie more than, say, The Shining. Yeah, I think so. I think maybe other than Pet Cemetery, Carrie might really? be the film after that that I've seen the most. I think I might have seen Pet Cemetery the most. I almost oh, agree, they're, they're but then... kind of close. Yeah, but I almost agree. Then I remember how many times I've seen The Shawshank Redemption, and it's like, shit, I've seen that one a lot. <laughs> I think they you know? like Green Mile quite a lot as well, actually. Yeah, so it is the problem. It's up there, though. That's the thing, if you would have been Yeah, the definitely. Top 10 I, I'm pretty viewed. confident I'm in, like, double figures with it, you know. Mm. I don't think there's any film in the whole of my life, maybe bar one or two, that I've seen, like, you know, I don't think I've seen anything, like, 20, 30 times. Um, I don't mm. think so. So, you know, I, I reckon I've seen Carrie like 10, 11, 12 times in total. And then I've seen the remake, obviously, as well. <laughs> so I don't know if that counts towards it. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna make sure I don't... I, I, I'm going to hold off watching that remake until we get around hmm. to do this. I'm just going to save it for that so it's really fresh in my head. Um, when when was the last time you watched Carrie, though? Like, not, not saying necessarily not, for this, but... Not long, including for this. Oh, yeah. God, it's got to be... A long time? Yeah, it's got to be. It's years at least, if we're not, yeah. not maybe. I can't even remember that's how long it's nah. been because and it's that so was familiar in my head. It was the same for me. I couldn't remember either, but I'm just what I like when you rewatched it or whatever for this. Mm. Did you find it as enjoyable? Because that's yeah. the interesting thing. And that's the thing yeah. I did too. I, I, I was a bit like, oh God, I've seen this film so many times. And the minute I pressed play, I was back in it, mesmerized, yeah. enjoyed, you know, it thoroughly again, which. Yeah is really i guess proof of of how good this this is as a film and an adaption and one of the things about it is that i immediately was like oh yeah this isn't a long film this moves at a snappy pace it introduces yeah. you here's our characters here they are these are the problems 
have a little look at them, you know, goggle at them and so on. Now, this is what we're doing and this is where we're going. Enjoy the ride. That's such a big fucking deal. Uh, because, of course, with King and with later and so on, things would get blowered, things would get long, things would be extended. Yeah. And we'll deal with that when it comes to it. But just having this really nice title, and obviously it fits the book as well because the book itself, even though stuff missing, is not a big book at all. I don't no, even know not. if we can call it a novel. I don't know if it's classed as a novel, is it? it might be yeah, a it's classed as a novel, novel but I think okay. if it came out these days, it wouldn't be. Mm. It's not, you know. It's certainly no stand. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that's the thing like I'm that. referring to. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is one of the best ever, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're judging these things on whether it's a good adaptation. I mean, obviously we're judging them on whether we enjoy them and we would both enjoy this, but is it a good adaptation? You know, it's one of the best. Yeah. It's one of the best. Do you agree? Are you one of the people who've not seen it? I'll be fascinated to see them. He's like, I've never watched it, never really interested. I find that hard to believe. I feel like it's one of the mm. most viewed movies out there. But you got any thoughts and you know what to do, let us know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please help us out by giving us a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button. If you really liked what you saw, consider donating to keep the website and channel running by buying us a coffee via our coffee page or picking up some merch from our big cartel store. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as via our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as listen to our interviews via SoundCloud, Apple Music, and Spotify. Just search for GBHBL. Games, horror, and heavy metal. What else is life for? <laughs>